Welcome to First Look, Washington Post Live's one-stop shop for news and analysis. I'm Jonathan Capehart, associate editor at The Washington Post. Well, one of the more perplexing aspects of the 2024 election season is that despite economic indicators pointing in the right direction, President Biden and his administration aren't getting the credit. Washington Post economics correspondent Abba Bhattarai went to the heartland of America to find out why. And she joins me now. Abba, welcome back to First Look. Thanks so much, Jonathan. All right. So you recently went to like the heart of the heartland, Sheboygan, Wisconsin, to gauge the electorate's view uh, on the economy. Um, that town has low unemployment with great jobs market. Um, but what's the mood of the of the voters in Sheboygan? Yeah, this is a part of the country where the economy is pretty exceptional. Uh, there are a lot of stable, well-paying factory jobs, manufacturing jobs, um, and it has some of the lowest gas, housing, and grocery prices in the country. And yet the voters were less than enthusiastic about either the economy or the election. Um, a lot of them said they expected to vote. You know, they were just going to do it like check it off the list later this year, but they they really weren't looking forward to it and they didn't feel strongly that there was a candidate who really understood what they were going through. That's interesting. So was it, I, I, I use the word perplexing for a reason because I just don't, for all the things you just said, low gas prices, low food prices, low housing prices, and folks still feel, is it, is it rooted in the economy or is it just sort of general dyspepsia? You know, I think it's I think it's both, but they sort of they express it through economic discontent. And uh, I hung out at the Piggly Wiggly there and a lot of them said that going to the grocery store, you know, a few times a week or whatever really kind of hit home all of the things that they thought were wrong with the direction of the country. And it just kind of stirred this deep discontent in them every time that they saw that, you know, bread prices were five dollars or what have you. So I was just about to ask about grocery prices, because those are among the top issues driving down the president's approval numbers. But how big a problem um, are grocery prices when it comes to uh, the president standing in key swing states like Wisconsin? We know from polling that inflation is consistently one of the biggest issues that people point to. And within that, grocery prices are a big deal, um, in part because this is something people encounter you know, several times a week. Uh, and that was really true in Wisconsin. Um, a lot of the people I talked to said that they were feeling pretty down on the president. They felt like things were maybe better three or four years ago under President Trump when there was no inflation. OK, can we talk about this? How, how, <laughs> how do these folks think that things were better? I mean, look, I understand. I, I'm not laughing at people for what they think. I'm just, I'm just mystified because when you look at all the economic indicators and specifically where we are today compared to where we were exactly four years ago right now, things are objectively better. Absolutely. I mean, the job market is very strong. We're seeing wage growth. People are spending. They have more money in the bank than they did before the pandemic. But, you know, I think inflation has really left its mark. It's left people feeling like they have no control over their money, that prices could swing up at any moment. And at the same time, you know, a lot of people's bank accounts got very flush during the pandemic. They weren't spending. There was extra stimulus money from the government. And since then, they've seen their savings account just dwindle and dwindle without much opportunity to refill it back up. And so I think psychologically, that's leaving people feeling like, oh, things are getting worse and there's not a whole lot of opportunity to turn that around. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm, thinking about my, I'm thinking about myself because, yeah, during the pandemic, I didn't spend a whole lot, but I think I would only have myself to blame if I look right now and look at my bank account and there isn't nearly as much money in there because I'm out, I'm eating out, I'm going to stuff, I'm living life again. So I want to, I keep ticking down these, these big economic numbers, but I, we got to keep looking at the, at the big picture. The U.S. has the highest rate of economic growth among um, nations in the G7. The stock market um, crossed, four, did it cross 40,000 yesterday? It crossed 40,000. We're at record highs, the stock market. Unemployment at 3.9%. It's been under 4% for more than two years, and this is the lowest it's been in 50 years. So really, how strong is the economy right now? 
it's exceptionally strong. And I think it's rebounded from the pandemic in a way that nobody could have ever imagined. I mean, until last year, there were real concerns that we were going to fall into a recession. We haven't. The economy is chugging along healthily um, and it's it's doing great. Um, uh, I'm going to come back to the prices in a moment. But since we're at the macro level, the Federal Reserve met this week, but left interest rates unchanged. Does that indicate that the Fed doesn't believe inflation is under control for the moment? And do you expect rate hikes to resume this year? So the Fed is very hopeful that it's on the right track with inflation, uh, but it's cautiously optimistic. I think the last thing it wants to do is lower rates and then have to raise them again. Um, but we do know from Fed policymakers that they think that they're likely done raising rates and they're even expecting to cut rates as many as three times this year. Uh, so it's it's a waiting game in a lot of ways, but we have seen a lot of progress on inflation, although there are still some worrisome pockets of high prices, especially in services, which means like restaurant prices and healthcare prices, and those are pretty tricky to get down. You know, the, the Biden administration, when you, when you ask them the question about you know, if everything is going so great, as you say, why are your poll numbers down? And the response back is, well, it's because folks are just beginning to feel the, the effects of all the legislation we were able to pass about the infrastructure bill, the American Rescue Plan uh, and, and other things. Does that ring true? Are we about to see a lot of the programs and things that were a part of those a part of those now laws, particularly the Inflation Reduction Act, are they about to kick in this year, like right around now? Um, there are signs that there are. We're already seeing job growth, um, increased spending, private investments um, that are picking up because of these uh, efforts by the administration. And we're also seeing signs that people are starting to notice. People are feeling better about the economy in the last few months. They've noticed that inflation is not going up, prices aren't going up, things are stabilizing. But what's interesting is that they're still feeling pretty down on Biden. They're not giving him a lot of credit, even though they feel better about the economy. Yeah, Yo, here's a, the, the, the um, very interesting question I forgot to ask, because you reported that the administration is trying to lower the cost of groceries by bringing down fertilizer prices and encouraging competition in the agriculture industry. Um, talk more about that. Yeah, these are longer term plays and, you know, the president doesn't have a whole lot of control over grocery prices. Uh, they're doing what they can to encourage more supply. They're doing what they can. Um, but it's a it's a longer term play and it's not going to have a direct effect immediately. Um, and even when it does start to have an effect, we're going to see what we've been seeing in the last year, which is stabilizing grocery prices. Uh, food prices remained flat in February. They're not getting higher, um, but people aren't really noticing because what they notice is that everything costs 25 percent more than it did four years ago when they go to the grocery store. You know, I, I, I know you are our um, economics reporter and you, you don't specifically cover Congress. However, I have to ask you, we are on the precipice of maybe another government shutdown if Congress doesn't get its act together by midnight tonight. What kinds of... What kind of an impact would a government shutdown have on the economy um, in the short term or even the, even the long term? Let's say they can't get their act together in a week or even two. It would take a prolonged period of disarray and shutdown for it to actually show up in the economic numbers. But I think the bigger concern is just continued voter disillusionment, people feeling like there is just kind of a mess in Washington and that they don't have a lot of faith in the system. Um, and so I think that level of uncertainty just kind of shakes things up even more. Yeah, I mean, the level of dysfunction uh, at the Capitol is mind blowing, even for me. And I've been watching this this crazy television show called The Capitol for 17 years. So just when I thought it couldn't get any more dysfunctional, it does. Uh, Abba Batarai, Washington Post economics correspondent. Thanks for coming back to First Look. Have a good weekend. Thank you. Time for the Opinions Roundtable. So let's go to the opinion side of the Washington Post, where we will find Washington Post columnists, E.J. Dion and Megan McArdle. E.J., Megan, welcome back to First Look. Good to be with you and with Megan. Thanks for having yeah. me. 
Sure. And I did the pause because I wanted to see who was wearing the Brady Bunch boxes. <laughs> um, so, EJ, um, President Biden's poor numbers on the handling of the economy, are they attributable to facts or poor messaging on the part of the, of the campaign and or the administration? Well, I think some there is a, a messaging problem. They haven't sold it as well as they could. The grocery prices, as you kept saying, uh, is part of the cause, cause of this dyspepsia. Really nice to see the word dyspepsia <laughs> on this show. Um, you know, it, George it Will's mystif- not here, so I figured I'd bring some some interesting words it, to the program. It, it, it's a it's an accurate word too, I think, for this. You know, and this is very frustrating for the Biden people and for Democrats. When Ronald Reagan ran for re-election in 1984, saying it was morning America in America, unemployment was at seven percent, and inflation was around four percent. With Joe Biden, he's running for re-election. Inflation and unemployment are both below four percent. This is a great economy, um, and as you said, the question is. Why? I think the inflation spike of 2022 had a real impact on people. That's why they're still uh, talking about grocery prices. I think in a weird way, Donald Trump gets off the hook uh, because people kind of white out the uh, pandemic, even though the pandemic was a big cause of the price spike because of the supply chain messing up because everything was shut down. Um, it, It hurts Biden, but it actually helps Trump. But there is some evidence that the economic good news is starting to have an effect. There is a very interesting poll from uh, Suffolk, USA Today, which showed that in uh, July, only 9% of Americans uh, said they thought the economy was in recovery. That's up to 33%. There's a big, big increase among moderates who will be very important in the election, a big increase among seniors. Probably they have the 401ks more than anyone else benefiting from the stock market. And a huge jump among Democrats, which is the first step uh, that Biden needs to take in order to consolidate his strength. And I think the other thing that started to happen is real wages. Uh, That is wages after you take into account inflation have been going up now for quite a while. And what's really interesting is this really is a bottom-up recovery. The biggest wage increases are in the bottom 40% of the income structure. Now, will that all uh, make everything wonderful for Biden? No, he's going to have a struggle. But I think there is some evidence that the good news is starting to penetrate, even if those grocery prices will be troublesome probably for the whole campaign. Mm-hmm. Megan, I'd love to get your thought on this, and also um, this point. You know, as as EJ was talking, you know, he mentioned you know Reagan's Morning in America. Uh, I remember that ad, and I remember that being the mantra when he was when Reagan was running for re-election. But another question, I think it was Reagan who asked, "Are you better off now than you were four years ago?" And that's a question that Donald Trump has asked recently uh, on social media. And the Biden campaign came out with an ad that takes that question and shows people exactly where they were four years ago. And it wasn't a happy time. So um, from your vantage point, Megan, the Biden's poor numbers when it comes to poll numbers, when it comes to his handling of the economy, do you think um, it's the facts or poor messaging on the part of the administration and or the campaign? I don't think it's messaging. Um, I, I just, in part because I actually just in general believe that political messaging, it, it's the it's the rider on top of the horse, it's not the horse. You can't fix a problem by better messaging. You can kind of amplify, um, you know, things that are already going well by messaging it well in the way that Reagan did. Um, so I think this is a really hard problem. We have all been wondering why, you know, unemployment is so low, the economy is growing, why isn't Biden doing well? I have come up with three non-mutually exclusive theories. And one is just that people hate inflation. They hate inflation more than anything. Some of this inflation is, is Biden's fault. Some of it is Trump's fault. Some of it's supply chain um, from the pandemic. You know, Some of the relief 
the relief bill he did was too big. Trump sent out unnecessary checks too. And those were going to create inflation. I knew that during the pandemic. And I was kind of surprised by the number of people who didn't see that coming. Um, second thing is, if I imagine myself as a lower wage worker, and I think about what happened to me during the pandemic, right? Yes, I piled up balances um, in my savings account because of these government programs. But one thing that's important to emphasize is we actually were paying people more than who were unemployed more than they were making while they were working, if they were at the, at the lower end, like the bottom 60% of the income distribution. For those people, it's not just that they had more money in their bank accounts. It's that you saw this with people saying, you know what, I don't like service work. I'm going to go do something else. I am going to invest in a home. I'm going to do, and a lot of those dreams weren't realized. And now they have spent down those, they didn't see the inflation coming. And it turned out that most of that money just got consumed by chasing goods and services that other people also wanted because we hadn't actually in, enhanced the productivity of the real economy. So even though they're not worse off than they were four years ago, they're not as well off as they expected to be four years hence back then. And I think that that's a big part of this story. Um, and you know, the third thing is that I think we often, um, if you look at how people talk about the economy, it really changes with their opinion of the candidate. <laughs> and so you see like the Democrats think the economy is way better than Republicans do. And that flipped as soon as Biden took office, literally like, <laughs> a week later, suddenly, yeah. right? And so I think that some of what people are saying about the economy may actually just be that they don't like Biden for other reasons, and that colors how they view their personal experience of the economy. You know, you Could did- Could I jump did. in there, uh, John? Yeah, I was, I was gonna ask you, but Megan, I was, you know, wasn't looking at the camera before because I was taking notes. Anytime someone says, I've got three things, we're like, okay. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Go ahead. And Megan McCardle is no Rick Perry. She remembered all three of them. That was impressive. <laughs> um, I just want to say uh, one point I made, made I, I thoroughly agree with, which is that attitudes toward the economy are now so connected to partisanship. We could have every job in America filled, zero unemployment, zero inflation, and most Republicans would say it's a terrible economy. Uh, that was true, a slightly lesser degree, but true the other way around. Uh, for Democrats when Trump was president. Uh, we don't need to litigate this. I disagree. I think the American Rescue Plan is part of the reason why we did not go into recession. If there was, there may have been a relatively small inflation effect, I think the inflation effect was from the supply chain. But I agree with Megan's focusing on discrete groups who are uh, particularly unhappy now. Uh, and I think when I looked at a Pew study, at, a really good Pew study at the beginning of the year, and this is problematic for Biden and he's got to figure out how to fix it. Young people are particularly unhappy with the economy. And here's where, for example, the high interest rates the Fed imposed to bring down inflation are having some real, really bad effects for young people in the housing market. And even if you needed to raise those rates, that's still a problem for them. And uh, Black and Latino voters, uh, many of whom are working class, uh, they have probably seen wage increases, but obviously from their point of view, they're not enough. And so I think when you think about where the campaign is going to be fought around the economy, I think the Biden people especially are going to have to focus a lot of firepower on young people, younger voters, and also on uh, Black and Latino voters. Yeah, easy. Let me say. Yeah, I you. think. Yo, go, go ahead, Megan. Oh, go sorry. Ahead. I was going to say. I mean, I, I would add this. First of all, I actually agree with you, EJ, that some of the economic growth is also because of these big stimuli. But people just really hate inflation, and I think that that is going to hurt Biden. Um, and I, you know, I also think that the cost of money has been. We've been paying not enough attention to how that impacts people. Um, you know, everyone got so used to declining interest rates for decades, and this has fed into everything. It feeds into the value of your home as well as the difficulty of buying a home, right? It's all of it, difficulty of buying a car. And I think that we have not been thinking about how inflation is experienced for people who are debt heavy, um, especially because people in our class tend to be much less debt heavy than, than people kind of down towards the middle. Um, you know, I... I've been wondering this, um, and I'll just call this a jump ball because I don't know who who best to ask this question. But which which is more damaging, 
for the uh, American consumer. Is it inflation or is it a recession? We didn't get a, re we had high inflation, which is coming down, but we didn't get a recession. And so it seems to me it, w w the, the United States had a choice. Either. I, I, I think that's or, right. Go ahead. Inflation is, inflation is better than a recession. I absolutely agree with it. I am not really arguing. I don't know that we would have had a recession absent, you know, if, if the stimulus, if the relief bill that, that uh, Biden did had been half as big. But I mean, I think probably it, it averted some chance of that, right? And I agree that inflation is better than a recession. The problem is that voters don't see that counterfactual, right? right? They are not experiencing this as absent this inflation, I would have not, you know, 10% of the people I know would not have jobs. They are just experiencing this as when I go to the grocery store, suddenly everything seems like it costs twice as much. Mm -hmm. And they don't make that trade off. And that's just the political reality that presidents have to deal with. The guy in charge gets credit for things that they didn't do if the economy is going well, and they get blamed for stuff that they didn't do if the economy is going badly. Right. The man on the horse. Go ahead, no, and I agree. I think it, inflation is better than a recession, uh, especially for people of lower incomes. A they're the first people out of work. They tend to be um, in a recession. Um, the and and you know, in fact, we've paid a relatively low inflationary price for uh, avoiding this recession. But it just doesn't feel that way when you're paying higher prices. And I think Megan and I agree very much that these high interest rates are causing all kinds of ripples that people see as negative in the economy. The housing market is a big piece of that, but there are other areas. And if the Fed actually brings those rates down three times before the end of the year, at least a couple of times before the election, you might also see some of these numbers uh, in terms of, you might see more satisfaction with the economy. Okay, we've I had a- I think that's- Oh, go ahead, oh, Megan. Sorry, I was just gonna the... say, I think that's probably right, but it probably has to happen by June. I think most of the, the sort of data on elections is that after midsummer, changes in economic data don't help you that much if you're, if you're running for president. All right. Let's Normally I'd agree with that, but I think there are so many, there's such a small, very undecided pool of voters that it may even help down the road because they'll still be deciding in September. But your history is on your side on this, Megan. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> this is like being at the US Open just when I thought the point was over. Okay, so we had a kumbaya on, the, on economics. Now let's turn to the Israel-Hamas war and the growing rift between the United States and the Israeli government led by Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. EJ, you had a column uh, about this saying that many of Israel's friends were thinking exactly what Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer said in his speech calling out um, the Israeli Prime Minister. Talk more about that. Well, you know, somebody called my attention after I wrote that to a YouGov poll, and I hope I'm remembering these precisely right, that among Republicans, Netanyahu had an approval rating somewhere around 57 percent. Among Democrats, it was 9 percent. Um, and I think there is a very big swath of opinion in the Democratic Party that is broadly pro-Israel in the sense that they believe that, we're, that a Jewish homeland needs to survive, but also believes that you need a settlement that will provide self-determination for Palestinians through the creation of a state, however hard uh, that might be, and who are very critical of Bibi Netanyahu, the way he handled uh, uh, Hamas before the war, and Israelis are not happy about that across a lot of uh, ideological lines, uh, but also the way in which he has pushed back against any kind of talk about how you might bring about uh, some sort of peace with Palestinians after the war. Uh, and so Schumer, who, Chuck Schumer, who is about as pro-Israel as anyone in Congress, he even vote, broke with President Obama on the Iran uh, agreement uh, when uh, Obama was president. Um, he's standing up and saying this. It's hard to think of a more powerful expression of the frustration uh, uh, with Netanyahu and President Biden has felt this now for a while after embracing Netanyahu. 
um, hoping that this would give him some influence on Netanyahu and Israeli policy. Um, he said uh, Schumer gave a good speech. Those simple words, a good speech, sent a huge message. And I think now you're seeing with the U.S. moving in the United Nations uh, to look for a long-term ceasefire linked, it should be said, to the release of hostages. I think we're going to see a much more open conflict between President Biden and Prime Minister Netanyahu uh, in the coming weeks and months. Yeah, and on, on that point, Megan, um, you know, Speaker Johnson apparently is going to invite Netanyahu to address Congress. Now, I find this interesting for a couple of reasons. One, the prime minister lashed out at uh, Senator Schumer saying, how dare you interfere in you know, our domestic politics? But the second reason why I thought this was interesting is because I remember when at the invitation of, I think it was Speaker Boehner, Benjamin Netanyahu as prime minister came to the United States, addressed Congress and blasted then President Obama for his for for the Iran nuclear deal. So who's getting involved in in whose domestic politics? But I would love to get your view on on all of this. But whether you think it is wise for Speaker Johnson to invite the prime minister here, given now sort of the open tensions, not between Israel and the United States, but between President Biden and Benjamin Netanyahu. Uh, far be it from me to ever say that any Republican speaker of the last 10 years has done something wise. Um, but I, I, I would say this, I think this is a sideshow. And I think that it is a sideshow by design, right? The critique of Benjamin Netanyahu allows Democrats to feel like they are distancing themselves from Israeli policy and to, it gives them a convenient person to blame. Um, the fact is, what Benjamin Netanyahu is doing is wildly supported by all Israelis. The problem is not Benjamin Netanyahu. If you replaced him, policy the policies that, that the Democratic base is upset about, and that I, I have some sympathy to that upset, um, wouldn't change. The overwhelming consensus in Israel is that they will not stop this war until Hamas has been completely destroyed. And that is a problem for Democrats, especially. It is a problem that U.S. foreign policy has to negotiate. But changing Netanyahu would not in any way change this. And, and by sort of saying this, right, Schumer, as one of my, my friends uh, who has lived in Israel said, um, he, if, he were, if, if, if Netanyahu were an American politician, he should have been dinged for making an in-kind contribution to his, his re-election campaign. Um, this is about the only thing that is strengthening Netanyahu, who is otherwise doomed as soon as this war ends. Um, by doing this, we're actually helping him stay in power, not challenging his access to power. Do you, do, do you, you agree know, with I, that? I think Net Netanyahu has always run against American politicians. He ran against Barack Obama the entire time he was in office. And so I'm sure he'll now be running against uh, Chuck Schumer as he's already started. I think that Israeli public opinion is more complicated than that. Um, Megan is correct that there is enormous desire to defeat Hamas after the attacks of October uh, 7th. But I think a different government in Israel would not necessarily would not pursue the same after the war policies as Netanyahu. I think a different, more centrist government. Uh, in Israel might not pursue the same way of going after Hamas uh, that is causing all of this death that it has really turned a lot of the world, including people who were supportive of Israel, uh, against Israel. Uh, so I do think that the focus on Netanyahu is not a sideshow, um, even if Israeli public opinion is more hawkish uh, than uh, public opinion among American Jews. And by the way, we can't let go of Donald Trump's comments that somehow Jews who vote Democratic mm -hmm. are anti-Jewish. That would make 70 percent of American Jews uh, anti-Jewish or anti-Israel. Uh, and that was an astonishing statement Trump made. Yeah. And, you know, I, I viewed um, that statement by Donald Trump to be in part of, a, a, of an ongoing thing that he does where he um, lashes out at specific groups of people, but then pits them against each other. So uh, Jewish Americans against Democrats, 
uh, black Americans against migrants, us versus them. We, we, we have seen it now since it came down that escalator in, in 2015. Um, we've got like 90 seconds left, but there's not even a question I could ask right now where either of you wouldn't have us go over by 10 minutes. So I'm just, gonna, I'm just going to end the conversation here. EJ Dion, Megan McArdle, as always, thank you for coming to First Look. Have a good weekend. Great joy to be with you. you. <clears throat> for more of these important conversations, sign up for a Washington Post subscription. Get a free trial by visiting wapo.st slash live. That is W-A-P-O dot S-T slash live. Also, today marks 359 days that Wall Street Journal reporter Evan Gershkovich has been wrongly imprisoned in Russia. His crime, journalism. And we must remind you that on August 13th, 2012, Austin Tice, was kidnapped while reporting in Syria for several news organizations, including the Washington Post. As our publisher, William Lewis, recently said, the detention of reporters anywhere, like Evan Gershkovich, Austin Tice, and others, is an affront to freedom of expression. I'm Jonathan Capehart. Thank you for watching Washington Post Live's First Look.